Happy Saturday. This week on the show, I talked to Jeremy Katz about his new book, The Jewish Community of Atlanta, as well as the work that he does at the Bremen Museum and how that museum is preserving past, present, and what they hope will be future of the Jewish community in Atlanta for everyone. And in our discussion, we also talked about our previous episode on the Hebrew benevolent temple bombing, and we're replaying that as a Saturday classic today. This episode originally came out February 20th, 2017. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And uh, for our listeners, like I know sometimes when I'm listening to podcasts, I'm just letting them flow and I don't always look at what's coming next, like when I'm driving around. Mm -hmm. But if you are a person that looks at your podcast selection and you pick one or you just see it come up and you like to read what's coming up, uh, if you saw the title for today's episode, you might be braced for a really horrific or upsetting story. I, in fact, was braced for such a thing when you told me what you were researching (laughs) this week. Uh, I give you... Relief, because the bombing of the Hebrew Benevolent Congregation Temple in Atlanta in the late 1950s was a unique moment in the civil rights movement. And while there are some elements of the temple's pre-bombing history and some uh, ideologies that are troubling and horrific, I will give you a spoiler and say that overall this is really a very, very hopeful story. Yeah, there there is definitely a bombing. There is also racism and anti-Semitism, but the story is not the parade of tragedy you may be expecting based on title. Correct. So it it may not, if you were worried or scared that this was one you just were not ready for today, uh, it is probably not going to be as upsetting as you think. Although, of course, there is some upsetting rhetoric being discussed on the part of people that would bomb a thing. Uh, so we're going to hop right into it. While Atlanta has had a Jewish population since the city was founded at the end of 1847, Jews were really a small minority of the city's people. In 1850, fewer than 30 Jews were recorded living in Atlanta, less than 1% of the city's residents. And by 1860, the year before the United States Civil War began, the Jewish population in the city had doubled. Atlanta's Hebrew Benevolent Society was also founded. That organization came together with two primary missions, assisting the city's impoverished Jewish population and securing a burial ground. Two years after the Civil War ended, while Atlanta was still rebuilding as a city, the Hebrew Benevolent Society took its next step, establishing a temple. And this move was precipitated by the words of the Rabbi Isaac Leeser of Philadelphia, who was here presiding over a wedding. That was the first Jewish marriage ceremony in Atlanta in January of 1867. And Rabbi Leeser told the southern city's Jewish community that they should establish a permanent place of worship. And his words were definitely heard, and they were encouraging. When the Hebrew Benevolent Congregation was founded in 1867, it was the first official Jewish institution in Atlanta. By the late spring of that year, just four months after Rabbi Leeser's encouragement, they had their charter. Over the next eight years, the congregation planned and built a temple in downtown Atlanta, which was completed in 1875. The early years for the temple, which is the name it came to be known by, that shortened version, were a little bit rocky. There was a series of changeovers in rabbis as the congregation struggled with its identity and the type of worship that it would favor, swaying between traditional and reform ideologies. But in 1895, 23-year-old Rabbi David Marks was hired, and he would stay at the temple for more than half a century, steering it toward classical reform Judaism. When Rabbi Marx retired after World War II, he was replaced with Rabbi Jacob Rothschild in 1946. Rothschild built on Marx's work in fostering connections with the greater Atlanta community, including with other religious faiths. Rabbi Rothschild was also a vocal supporter of civil rights and social justice, and this was a departure from his predecessor's work, who had felt that in order to keep his congregation as safe as possible from anti-Semitic sentiments in the community, it was best to avoid confrontations with the wider community on such issues. 
to be clear, there was a very real and understandable reasoning behind Marx's efforts to keep peaceful relationships with Atlanta's Gentile population. Many of the temple community remembered vividly an event from 1913 when a member of the temple named Leo Frank was lynched by a mob after being accused of the murder of a young girl. The evidence against him was thin, but by virtue of being an outsider, being a northerner who had moved to the south and a Jew, Leo Frank became a a scapegoat who was easy to vilify. That is a way oversimplified version of this story. We have an episode about it in the archive. It was a huge miscarriage of justice. And much of the Jewish community in Atlanta opted to keep a low profile after that out of of self-preservation. Yeah, so when we say that that Rabbi Marx had not been vocal about civil rights, it wasn't necessarily because he didn't care about them, but he was very concerned about the anti-Semitic issues that were still very much a part of culture at the time. But on Yom Kippur, almost from the time that he became the rabbi at the temple, Rothschild used the holiday as an opportunity to speak about segregation and to vocally oppose Jim Crow laws. He did so during subsequent Yom Kippur sermons as well. It kind of came to be expected as the topic. And in 1948, he included the following as he addressed his congregation. How comforting this day might be. Here is the perfect opportunity to find ourselves forgiven. God's standard is too high for us. His law is too difficult. Our sins were just the expected failures of all mortals. All we need to do, therefore, is come into his presence on each Yom Kippur, acknowledge our inevitable guilt, and pray for forgiveness. And lo, we shall be forgiven. We are held accountable for our conduct. We are responsible for our acts. Don't rationalize your guilt by claiming that morality is too difficult for attainment by mere man. Don't pretend helplessness because the right way to live is placed out of your reach. Don't for a moment think that you can blame your sinfulness on the fact that goodness is beyond your grasp. Quite the opposite is true. We must do more than view with alarm the growing race hatred that threatens the South. The problem is ours to solve, and the time for the solution is now. We have committed no overt sin in our dealings with Negroes. I feel certain that we have treated them fairly. Certainly, we have not used force to frighten them. We have even felt a certain sympathy for their predicament. No, our sin has been the deeper one, the evil of what we didn't do. This was, as you might suspect, not entirely welcomed rhetoric. The fear of bigoted anti-Semitic sentiment was still very real to some of the people that Rothschild was speaking to. They had lived through that 1913 incident and they knew how scary the world could be. They didn't want to invite conflict or stir up trouble and they were certainly afraid of stirring up the level of anti-Semitism that had led to Leo Frank's murder. I would say also this was in the 1940s. So there was... Huge reason to be afraid based on events going on in Europe. Yep. Like there was there was a lot of, of reason that people felt the need to stay quiet. And then additionally to all that, Rothschild was something of an outsider himself. He was from Pittsburgh and he came to lead the temple after having served as an army chaplain. So while some of his congregation agreed with his ideas but feared retribution for them, others dismissed his message as being out of touch with the culture of the South and the tentative peace among the differing cultures that made up Atlanta. But to Rothschild, the morality that he felt was an integral part of his faith meant that he had to use his platform to address social injustice. So he continued to speak out again and again. And he put actions behind his words. He joined interfaith organizations and civic groups, including the Southern Regional Council, the Georgia Council on Human Relations as well as uh, the Greater Atlanta Council on Human Relations. And under his stewardship, the temple hosted an institute for the Christian clergy every February. And while he worked hard to foster understanding across varying faiths, Rabbi Rothschild also worked to bridge the color divide as well, asserting that Black ministers must be included in these kinds of gatherings. And he also invited leaders of the Black community to speak at the temple. 
In late 1957, so after he had been working at this for about a decade in Atlanta, Rothschild co-authored the Atlanta Manifesto, which was an anti-segregation document that was signed by more than 80 area religious leaders and was directed at city authorities. While he worked on the manifesto, Rothschild was not one of the signatories because he felt that the city's Christian leaders should head the initiative for it to have its best chance at a positive reception. And that Uh, manifesto read in part. We do not believe that the South is more to blame for the difficulties which we face than are other areas of our nation. The presence of the Negro in America is the result of the infamous slave traffic, an evil for which the North was as much responsible as the South. We are also conscious that racial injustice and violence are not confined to our section and that racial problems have by no means been solved anywhere in our nation. Two wrongs, however, do not make a right. The failures of others are not just a justification for our own shortcomings, nor can their unjust criticisms excuse us for a failure to do our duty in the sight of God. Our one concern must be to know and to do that which is right. And all of this vocal opposition to racism on the part of the rabbi did not go unnoticed by the greater population. But unfortunately, the rabbi's efforts to foster understanding and compassion led to some very serious consequences. And we're going to talk about that right after we first pause for a little sponsor break. While there were people in Rabbi Rothschild's congregation who were a little unsettled by his constant engagement with social issues, there were plenty of people from outside the temple's community who were downright incensed. Uh, For example, in May of 1958, Rothschild was engaged as a speaker at Atlanta's First Baptist Church. In the evening of his lecture, a man appeared outside the church carrying a picket sign specifically against the rabbi. And then he later heckled the rabbi during the Q&A segment of the evening's presentation. And there was already a weird conflation on the part of white supremacist groups when it came to the Jewish and Black communities. If you listen to our episodes about the Palmer raids, you may recall how Palmer, in stirring up a panic, started to lump anarchists and communists together as one huge threat pool and then eventually cast suspicion on all immigrants. There was a similar, though different, rhetoric playing out in the South in the 1950s. And to be clear, there are Jewish Black people. Yeah. (laughs) But uh, this was viewing the Jewish community as a whole and the Black community as a whole as sort of the same general threat base. Yes. Uh, And so, for example, of how these things got combined, one flyer that was being circulated by the Christian anti-Jewish party at the beginning of the 1950s was titled Jews Behind Race Mixing. And this flyer claimed that the Jewish population was working against segregation so that the white race would be diluted and weakened, warning that, quote, a race once mongrelized is mongrelized forever. So there was no illusion that an outspoken rabbi arguing against segregation wasn't going to make people angry. But the real moment where it became clear that Rothschild Rothschild was really ruffling feathers came in the very early morning of October 12, 1958, when there was an explosion at the temple. It was 3.40 a.m. on a Sunday. Rabbi Rothschild was called at 7.25 a.m. by the custodian at the temple, Robert Benton. Benton had been the one to discover the damage when he arrived at work that morning. And you might think, uh, as you listen to this and you think about the timeline, that an explosion that large at three in the morning would have woken the neighborhood. And it did. But when police patrolled the area in response to calls about the noise, they did not drive up the temple's driveway. And from their perspective, they couldn't see the hole in the building from the street. So it looked like everything was fine. I'm imagining that they went to investigate this noise and then were basically like, huh, that was weird. Right? (laughs) 50 sticks of dynamite had been detonated at the temple's north entrance and the blast made a huge hole in the building. Fortunately, though, there were no injuries. There was, however, somewhere between $100,000 and $200,000 worth of damage to the structure depending on what source you are looking at. 
Yeah, especially if you're looking at newspapers from the time, the number varies wildly. Uh, One of the things that I read suggested that 200 was like the highest estimate, but as they, you know, got more and more information about how bad the damage was, it it crept downward a little bit closer to the $100,000 number. Still a very large sum in 1958. Or ever. (laughs) (laughs) Or now. Yeah, I think we're so used to modern uh, stories of, of... explosions or damages being in the billions that mm. it may not seem initially that large an amount to uh, the modern ear, but in fact, it's a lot of money. Uh, and this attack was claimed by a white supremacist group called the Confederate Underground. A man claiming to be the leader of the group and calling himself General Gordon phoned the United Press International office to tell them, quote, we bombed a temple in Atlanta. This is the last empty building we will bomb. Negroes and Jews are hereby declared aliens. At 6.15 that evening, there was another call, this time to the rabbi's home, where his wife Denise answered. They call, the call said, I'm one of them that bombed your church. I'm calling to let you know there's a bomb under your house and it's lit. You've got five minutes to get out and save your life. While Denise and a neighbor got themselves and their children out of the house, it turned out to have been an empty threat. Yeah, the police came and did a full scan of the house and found nothing. But how terrifying and horrible. Uh, And that same group, the Confederate Underground, had attacked a synagogue in Charlotte, North Carolina, the prior November. Though the dynamite that they used in that attack failed to detonate. And between that failed attempt and the explosion at the temple in Atlanta, the Confederate Underground had bombed four other temples and Jewish community centers. While their second attack in Gastonia, North Carolina, on February 9th, 1958, had also been thwarted by faulty dynamite, Their third and fourth bombings carried out just hours apart on March 16th at the Orthodox Temple Bethel in Miami, Florida, and the Jewish Community Center in Nashville, Tennessee, both caused building damage. The fifth attack at the Bethel Synagogue in Birmingham, Alabama on April 28th was unsuccessful, this time due to fuse failure. And the following day, there was another failed attack at the Jewish Community Center in Jacksonville, Florida. I feel like this highlights... The fact that, like, the series of bomb threats at Jewish community centers that is ongoing today has layers of being terrifying beyond just the fact that it's a bomb threat, right? Yeah. It's it's a bomb threat that's part of a history of bomb threats and bombings, specifically against Jewish centers and houses of worship. Because of those attacks and a protest demonstration outside the Atlanta Constitution offices in July, where protesters carried signs reading Free America from Jewish Domination, the temple and all synagogues throughout the South had increased their security. But this was not enough to deter the terrorists. The other thing that happened as a result of the previous attacks was actually an improvement in coordination across police forces from jurisdictions throughout the South. And so after the attack on the temple, the law enforcement network activated immediately. More than 75 detectives worked in conjunction with agents from the FBI and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation in an unprecedented effort to search for suspects in the crime. Five days after the bombing, on October 17, 1958, five men, all associated with the white supremacy groups, the National States' Rights Party, and the Knights of the White Camellia, were indicted for the blast. Wallace Allen, Robert Bowling, George Bright, Luther Corley, and Kenneth Griffin. And they eventually let one of the men go, but the first of the five men that they tried was George Bright. And his trial started on December 1st with Judge Derwood T. Pye presiding. The case against Bright was the strongest, the prosecutors believed. And the hope was that a conviction in his case would make it easier to convict his cohorts. They were kind of relying on a domino effect to take place. The evidence against Bright included a note found in his home that threatened terror against the Jewish population anti-Semitic literature found in his home, and testimony from an FBI informant who said that he had been in a meeting with the other men in May of that year where they planned the temple attack. Additionally, uh, the man we mentioned earlier who protested at a lecture giving, given by Rabbi Rothschild and then heckled him from the crowd was also George Bright. He had also been part of the anti-Semitic protest outside the newspaper offices. 
The jury in the case actually came to a deadlock. There were nine in favor of conviction and three that were opposed, and none were willing to budge. So uh, on the 10th day of the legal proceedings, Judge Pye declared a mistrial. A second trial soon followed, but this time Bright was acquitted. There's actually a whole weird side story where his um, lawyer was found in contempt of court and I think actually ended up doing some jail time, but he got his client off. (laughs) Uh, It sounded like a circus. Uh, But because of the failure to secure a guilty verdict in what they thought was clearly their strongest case, prosecutors eventually, it took quite some time, but they eventually dropped the charges against the other alleged conspirators. No other suspects were ever charged for the bombing. So there was absolutely never any justice in this case. Well, and this is also pretty circumstantial evidence. (laughs) Like, it is clear evidence that he was anti-Semitic but, like, not a conclusive thing directly connecting him to the bombing. Um, So while that's a somber element of this case, it does, as we mentioned at the top of the show, have some truly hopeful elements to it, and we will talk about those after a quick word from one of our sponsors. All of that outreach that Rabbi Rothschild had been doing in Atlanta's diverse communities, as uncomfortable as it sometimes made people, was really repaid in the aftermath of the bombing. People from all walks of life rallied around Rothschild and his congregation. Religious and civic leaders in Atlanta and then in the U.S. and then around the globe condemned the attack. The help came in both verbal condemnation of the attack and in financial support for the temple to rebuild. The mayor of Atlanta... Uh, At the time, William B. Hartsfield, a name you will recognize if you have ever flown in or out of Atlanta, said in an interview right after the attack, quote, my friends, here you see the end result of bigotry and intolerance, and whether we like it or not, those practicing rabble-rousing and demagoguery are the godfathers of the cross-burners and the dynamiters. Yeah, there's actually footage of of him making that pronouncement on television, and in his southern accent, it's quite charming. The editor of the Atlanta Constitution, Ralph McGill, another name you'll recognize if you've been in the city, we have a street named after him, wrote a series of editorials on the bombing, which eventually earned him a Pulitzer Prize, in which he said, quote, you cannot preach and encourage hate for the Negro and hope to restrict it to that field. When the wounds of hate are loosed on one people, then no one is safe. Donations came from rich and poor alike, including one which was sent in by Fulton County Prison Chaplain Bill Allison. The money, the chaplain explained, had been contributed by the prison's Black population who had taken up a collection to donate. The chaplain received a letter of thanks from Rothschild which said, quote, of all the gifts which we have received, this one certainly is one of the most meaningful and heartwarming. The social hall at the temple was named Friendship Hall to acknowledge the many people from all over Atlanta and the world who stood by Rothschild and his congregation and helped them rebuild. In the rabbi's first sermon after the bombing, he shared this message of hope. Quote, This despicable act has made brighter the flame of courage and renewed in splendor the fires of determination and dedication. It has reached the hearts of men everywhere and roused the conscience of people united in righteousness. All of us together shall rear from the rubble of devastation a city and a land in which all men are truly brothers and none shall make them afraid. The following year on the anniversary of the bombing, the temple had been repaired and red, white, and blue stained glass windows filled the space that had been the hole caused by the blast. And in a statement to the press that was made on that anniversary, Rabbi Rothschild said that the windows, quote, symbolize the basic faith of the people. While the bomb attack had the surprise consequence of bringing a lot of the Atlanta community together, it also highlighted the problems that were still so clear across the country. There were very valid questions raised about whether there would be such kindness and good PR if the same thing had happened at a Black church. There were already plenty of cases of racist violence on the books against African Americans that had not been pursued so diligently as the temple bombing or at all in some instances. The bombing in its reaction also caught the segregationist movement off guard. 
While supporters of segregation had long seen liberals from the North and the NAACP in the Supreme Court as their enemies in what they thought was right, there were also efforts at this point to try to disassociate from the militant white supremacist movements uh, like the National States Rights Party, the Knights of the White Camellia, and the KKK. Uh, They wanted not to let that mar what they thought was their correct ideology. And there were also some claims by white supremacist groups that this whole bombing had been staged just to incriminate them. There were certainly still many battles to fight in the civil rights movement and racial equality and, frankly, anti-Semitism still remain issues today. But the bombing at the temple is largely seen as a watershed moment that moved the civil rights movement forward. When Rabbi Rothschild's wife, Janice Rothschild Blumberg, wrote about the incident later in her life, she titled her writing, The Bomb That Healed. And in that writing, which uh, appeared in American Jewish History magazine, Janice also astutely acknowledged the racial divide that offered the temple a bit of privilege in the wake of this bombing. She wrote, quote, To church-going Atlantans, desecration of a house of God was an abomination. That it was Jewish made no difference. That its members were white probably did. And I also want to say that... uh, That particular piece of writing is spectacular, and I encourage people to go read it. It's available on JSTOR because she really captures what it was like to be in the midst of that sort of weird shockwave and what it was like from receiving that call in the morning, how they were dealing with it, what her emotions were doing, what the community was doing. It's a really, really good snapshot of that moment in history. Yeah. Well, and you and I, neither of us is Jewish, We have not spent our lives confronting anti-Semitism or racism, frankly. So having perspectives from people who are coming from that side of it is super important. Rabbi Rothschild continued for his entire life to be an outspoken advocate for equality, even more so after the bombing than before. He gave the eulogy for his friend Martin Luther King Jr. at an interfaith memorial in Atlanta after the civil rights leader was assassinated. He died of a heart attack on the last day of 1973. But the temple remains. It's changed and been renovated several times to accommodate its its ever-growing community. And it is still an active place of worship. It is also on the National Park Service National Register of Historic Places to Visit. Uh, I mean, it's a part of Atlanta that we see all the time. People drive by it. It is shown in the movie Driving Miss Daisy. It is. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous structure uh, and really lovely. So uh, that is the story of the temple bombing. And it's one of those things that I feel foolish. I did not, even though I live here in Atlanta and I have seen little snippets about it, I never really knew that much about it. Yeah, and you and I had a brief conversation before we started recording about... uh, Having in, even been, there's a Jewish history museum in Atlanta and having having even been there and I think gone through their uh, exhibition on a his, Jewish history in Atlanta through objects, it rang a bell, but I knew so little about it at all. Yeah, which is a pity. I mean, I, I know within the Jewish community, it is still a very big deal and something that they speak about a lot, but I had no knowledge of that fact prior to digging into this research. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Listener.